Hello and welcome. My name is Ravi Palacio. I'm one of the ASPC student leaders here on campus at Cascade. And uh, ASPCC Cascade takes pride in trying to bring you events um, that really celebrate the diverse campus culture that we have here, but also that events that initiate dialogue and thought around some of the hard conversations that are hard but necessary conversations that exist within our community. So today, ASPCC Cascade and the Multicultural Awareness Council are honored to sponsor today's uh, speaker who is among the nation's most prominent anti-racist educators. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the keynote speaker, critically acclaimed anti-racism author and activist, Tim Wise. Thank you. So I guess the saying is true that there is a first time for everything because as you all were filing in, you may have noticed sort of lingering up here on the stage, didn't really have a seat to sit in, didn't want to take a seat for many of you. And so I was figuring out where am I going to hang out? Where am I going to hide? And so I hid behind the American flag, which I'm fairly <laughs> confident I have never done before. And it is highly unlikely I will ever have the occasion to do it again. I neither wrap myself in it nor hide behind it, but in any event, I've now stepped out from the flag and can begin. Thank you all so much for coming. It is uh, wonderful to be back. I think it has been seven years since I was here on the campus. As I recall, I was here shortly before the presidential election in 2008. And gosh, I guess all they said about not having to have this conversation about racism anymore must not have worked out quite like they thought after that election. I somewhat shocked. I was so ready to retire, and I know all the rest of you who do civil rights work or have done civil rights work over the years were just thoroughly convinced that we had really attained post-raciality just as all women in the room are surely aware that sexism and patriarchy have been irretrievably smashed in Pakistan ever since the election of Benazir Bhutto there in 1988 and again in 91. Of course, she has since been assassinated, so I guess we know how some folks loved her. And what it all demonstrates, both in Pakistan and I would say as well, Israel, India, Great Britain, the Philippines, Ireland, and several other countries that have had female heads of state is the same thing. It demonstrates here in this country with regard to race, which is, and it's really not shocking, but it's worth repeating, right, that the elevation of individuals from otherwise marginalized groups really doesn't tell us very much, if anything, about larger systemic reality. And if we wish to talk about, let alone address, an issue like racism and racial inequality, or for that matter, sexism and gender inequity, or, or classism and the system of economic subordination of working class and low-income folks, we have to talk about those things as systems. So that's what I think folks brought me here to do today. It's certainly what I intend to do today. And it's a good time for us to have this conversation because for the last couple of years, and this year perhaps even more than the last two, um, there has been this sense that I've had that we as a country are sort of in commemoration mode. Here's what I mean by that. This, as you know, is the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March, the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. If you didn't know that, you know, there's a movie out that will remind you that it is the 50th anniversary of that. You should go see it. It's a good film. Last year was the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. So we talked a lot about that last year. Two years ago was the 50th anniversary of what? The March on Washington and the Birmingham campaign and the killing of Medgar Evers in Jackson, Mississippi and George Wallace standing in the schoolhouse door at the University of Alabama. So for the last couple of years, we've been doing this retrospective thing. And on the one hand, that's obviously good. We have an obligation morally and practically to commemorate our victories and the struggle and the work that others have done before us. So there's nothing wrong with looking backward. But the problem is when you get stuck in commemoration mode for a little too long, right, it becomes very easy to get frozen in this backward looking glance, right? where we're looking at the road behind, not really paying attention to the road ahead and what needs to be done. It's very easy to get stuck in that place where we look backward and say, look how far we've come, right? Because that's how we teach history in this country, in most of our high schools, unless you had really extraordinary history teacher. 
um, who didn't use the standard textbook. You probably were taught history very linearly, right? Which is to say, the United States had some really bad problems back in the day, but thank goodness good people got together and they solved the problems. Oh, and then there were some other problems, but then more good people got together and solved those. And it's always upward and onward. It's all taught very linearly. And sometimes commemoration exercises are very linear, right? You're looking back at the bad old days and you're saying, oh, thank God it's not like that. Oh, thank God cops aren't attacking people in the street like they were in Birmingham in 1963. Oh, wait. Thank God people have the right to vote and it's being protected by the government. Oh, wait. Right? So when you get stuck in that mode, you don't necessarily pay attention to all the things that and all the themes that continue to recur, not in a linear fashion, but in a very circular type of fashion, right? And so you can think of commemoration, it's sort of like a road trip, right? If you were taking a road trip from the tip of Maine down to San Diego, so basically one corner up here all the way to another corner down here, it would be like getting to Kansas, right? And the parents who were driving the car, they're like, oh my God, look how far we've come, right? But the kids in the back seat, right, they're looking ahead, they're like, are we there yet, right? When are we gonna get there, right? Because the young don't have much time for commemoration. Commemoration is what us older folk do, frankly. Commemoration, because we like to, we get nostalgic, right? And so even, even people that are in the struggle, we get nostalgic. We get nostalgic for the sit-ins. We get nostalgic for the Freedom Rides. We get nostalgic for the Selma to Montgomery March, just like some of those old white folks in Arizona get nostalgic for whatever the hell it is they get nostalgic for when they're out screaming, I want my country back. You know, nostalgic for 1939 or 1957 or Leave it to Beaver, or Andy Griffith's show, whatever the hell, Nick at Night when it was live, not reruns, right? Whatever they're nostalgic for, we can make fun of them, but we do our own version of it. And it can be very dangerous because we got young folks right now in this country putting their lives on the line, not for a memory, right? not for a retrospective, not for a history class, but for a reason that their lives are in jeopardy today, not 50 years ago. They're not threatened by Bull Connor, Bull Connor is dead. They're not threatened by Jim Clark, the sheriff in Selma who beat folks on that bridge and had his deputies do the same. He is dead, right? These are folks that are being threatened by a very modern form of racism, a very systemic and ongoing problem. So as we commemorate and as we enjoy films like Selma for what they can offer us, as both a historical narrative and as art, let us remember that when we're talking about this struggle, this is one that continues in a forward direction, not in reverse. And one of the problems, and I think it's becoming clearer by the day, is that despite all the successes of the civil rights movement that we should not take for granted, that we must honor and recognize, there was one large area of American life that was left virtually untouched by that movement, and it's the area that we've come to really talk about or to focus on today, the so-called criminal justice system. You see, the movement focused principally on what? Focused on educational apartheid. It focused on public accommodation discrimination. It focused on discrimination in employment with the Civil Rights Act, for instance. It focused on discrimination in the franchise with the Voting Rights Act and later in housing with the Fair Housing Act. But very little of the movement focused on the pernicious inequities within the enforcement of criminal law and the use by law enforcement of extrajudicial means for oppressing and marginalizing black and brown peoples. Now that's not meant as a criticism of the movement. You can only bite off so much at one time, but the problem is that by not really talking about that issue, it left that arena open to the continued trajectory of injustice, right? Whereas at least in those other areas, we have laws that can theoretically get at the problem don't always work, don't always get enforced, but at least they're there, right? At least there is a Fair Housing Act that technically, theoretically makes it illegal to discriminate in housing. Now we know it still happens, but at least there's a remedy. We don't have the equivalent. We don't have a ban on racial profiling. We don't have federal laws that really, we have a constitution that theoretically is there for that purpose, but proving constitutional violations of due process equal protection, very difficult to do in court the burden, the threshold very, very high, very little statutorily to address these kinds of inequities in the justice system. That's why we see them continue to proliferate. And this is interesting because if we know the history of racism in the country, we know that the justice system and law enforcement have been heavily implicated from the very beginning. 
So it's sort of odd that that wasn't talked about more in the movement, I suppose, because it was always present. By the 1930s, for instance, half of all black folks in this country who were killed by whites were killed by white cops. Right? Half of all blacks who were killed by white people, I'm not saying half of all blacks that were killed were killed by white people, I'm just saying of those who were, half of them were killed by white cops and the other half almost always with the collaboration of law enforcement. In the first 30 to 40 years of the 20th century, race riots repeatedly touched off by law enforcement with the collaboration of law enforcement, police encouraging the mob in places like East St. Louis, Illinois, not too far from Ferguson, across the river and a little way away, but not far. In 1917, one of the most infamous race riots in our country's history in which police actively participated. 150 were killed, including 35 children whose bodies were burned, thrown into bonfires, their skulls crushed by cops and by the mob, which the cops encouraged to engage in that kind of violence. It is important to acknowledge that the history of the slave patrols, that was law enforcement. The black codes, that was law enforcement. Segregation itself enforced by law enforcement, fugitive slave laws, law enforcement, the killing of 27 members of the Black Panther Party, including but not limited to Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, law enforcement, the bombing of the row houses lived in by the MOVE family and organization in Philadelphia in 1985, killing a dozen, including several children, law enforcement. And that history shapes very dramatically and clearly how folks of color, particularly African-American folk, but folk of color generally, experience things like the killing of Mike Brown, the killing of Eric Garner, the killing of Tamir Rice, the killing of John Crawford, Amadou Diallo, Patrick Dorsman, Malise Green, Sean Bell, Taisha Miller, uh, Trayvon Martin, for that matter, Rakia Boyd, Katherine Johnston. We could do 20 minutes of names had we the time to do so. That history shapes how people understand that, which is to say that when those kinds of incidents take place, they're not isolated incidents. A lot of times I figure white America does view them as isolated incidents, but after a while, too many isolated incidents become a pattern, and that pattern becomes something we have to understand systemically. They're not isolated. Every week in this country, roughly two black males or females are being killed by law enforcement or wannabe cops people like George Zimmerman, despite being unarmed and posing no direct threat to law enforcement in the moment or anyone else for that matter, African-American males 21 times more likely to be killed by law enforcement statistically than white males are. This is not because black males commit 21 times more crime than white males. It is not because black males are 21 times more likely to aggress against a police officer. In fact, there is some research there isn't a lot, but there is some which suggests that there is either no difference in the way that black and white folks interact with police. So in other words, no reason to believe that there would be a justification for that disproportion, or some of the research suggests that actually black folks are less likely to behave in an aggressive manner with regards to police when confronted, precisely because of this fear that doing so will get them killed. And in spite of that, the ratio is still 21 to one. But the problem, it appears, is that for the vast majority of those of us who are white, we don't see this, we don't comprehend this, we don't understand this. That may seem like an unfair and overly harsh generalization, but I think it's not because every time one of these cases happen, and they happen with alarming frequency as of late, the same response is heard from white America writ large. And that doesn't mean every white person, that means this corporate entity known as white America, this broad generality, right? which does not mean everyone, but it means enough to make it a pattern. The same thing is heard every time we hear this almost like repetitive motion disorder of the mouth. Right? A repetitive, dis uh, repetitive motion disorder of the mouth whereby white folks say things like, well, what did that black person do to provoke that officer? Right? This is an attempt to rationalize the killing of unarmed people. We start with that, the assumption being that they must have done something. This is not what we do with other crimes generally, although we actually we do this with regard to women who are the victims of sexualized violence, of course. We do the very same thing, and it's part of the same pattern, right? Taking marginalized populations and blaming them for their victimization. We do the same thing for trans folk when they are bashed and beaten and killed on the street. We do the same thing for LGBT brothers and sisters generally when they are bashed and killed on the street. We do the same thing with our Muslim brothers and sisters. So it's part of a pattern whenever a member of a marginalized group 
is beaten or killed, we want to ask the question, well, what did they do? The presumption being they must have done something. Right? But what did they do? What did Amadou Diallo do other than reach for his keys in the vestibule of his own apartment and his identification to prove that he lived there? He was, as you may recall, at the time of the incident involving him when he was killed by members of the street crimes unit in New York in the late 90s, he was in the vestibule of his own apartment. A car of officers pulls up. They pour out of the car with guns drawn. They're not wearing uniforms. They don't identify themselves as cops. So as far as Amadou Diallo knows, he's being held up, right? And he reaches for his keys and not having identified themselves as police, they proceed to shoot him over 40 times. What did Tamir Rice do in Cleveland last fall other than be black? Here's a 12-year-old child. You can watch the video yourself if you have the stomach to do it. A 12-year-old child playing with a toy gun in Cleveland, a toy gun, something that white children have played with throughout time immemorial since they started making toy guns. And keep in mind, please, that Ohio is an open carry state. So you can actually carry a real gun in Ohio with real bullets, as white people do all the time when they go shopping at Target. Right? Like seriously, later on today, you should Google the words white men, guns, Target, and watch all the pictures that pop up of white guys who feel like they have to go and take an AK-47 over their shoulder just to go get some toilet paper at the Target. Right? And then they go to the Chipotle with the AK on their shoulder, too, because i got to take my gun to Chipotle because they're out of carnitas. I can't get carnitas. I'm going to take my gun and tell them what I think about that. Then they go to church with the gun. White folks walking around with real guns, not getting shot. Tamir Rice playing with a toy in a park. And the cops come up. Now, they lied. They said the first time, you heard the story, right? They said, well, we told him to drop the weapon three times. Then finally pulled it out of his waistband and pointed it. They didn't know there was a video, see? Didn't know there was a video. Now we see on the video the car rolls up and within a second and a half max, Tamir Rice's body drops to the ground. He didn't pull his weapon. He didn't point it at anybody. And they didn't have time to tell him three times to drop his weapon. And then when his sister tried to go and comfort him, because she was there at the park with him, they wouldn't let her. They threw her in the back of the police car, wouldn't let his own sister as they let him sit there and bleed out. What did he do but be black? Nothing. What did John Crawford do in Walmart outside Akron? Once again, Ohio, Ohio is a real problem, apparently. Right. So what did John Crawford do? Well, it depends on who you believe. If you believe the guy that called the police on him, here's a guy in Walmart, right? And he calls the police because he sees John Crawford, black guy with a gun, and he describes it to the police as he's walking around with a gun, pointing it at children, threatening people with a weapon, right? Turns out it's an air rifle. Right? Not a particularly deadly piece of machinery. It's an air rifle, and he's not pointing it at anybody. In fact, the guy that called it in also didn't know there was a video. You can watch this video as well, and you'll see what? That John Crawford is on the phone. We know now he was talking to his girlfriend. He picks up an air rifle off a shelf that Walmart sells, and he's just walking around with it. He's letting it swing at his side. He's sort of using it like a, like a cane or a prop. He's just doing this with it. He's not doing anything. No one is even around him to be threatened, and no one looks threatened. The few people who come into the frame don't look scared, right? They see him talking on the phone. They don't figure he's there to hunt other human beings, right? But all of a sudden, you can see the split screen on the video. The cops come in, and they also said, we told him to drop the weapon. He didn't, so we shot him. That's not true. They shot him before he could have even seen them and likely heard them. They shoot him. He stumbles back up, wondering what's happening. He didn't have the weapon in his hand. It's on the ground four feet from him, and they drop him in a hail of bullets, and he dies. What did he do other than be black? And of course, there was no indictment in that case. Just so happens the cop who killed John Crawford is the only officer in the history of that suburban police department ever to kill someone in the line of duty, and he's now done it twice. Oh, and the cop that killed Tamir Rice was deemed unfit to be a cop a year and a half to two years before he killed that 12-year-old child, but they let him be a cop anyway. Right? What did they do other than be Black. What did Eric Garner do? Well, they say he was cig selling loose cigarettes on the street in Staten Island. Funny, they didn't find any cigarettes on his body as they took him to the morgue, right? So they accused him of doing something which, even if true, is not exactly punishable by death. Selling loose cigarettes, not exactly a major violation, but one they can't even prove because there's no video evidence of it. There were no cigarettes on his person. But they had harassed him for that several times before. They came up to him that day, did the same. What did Eric Garner do other than be black and mouth off to the cop? 
Because he said, leave me alone. It ends today. You all always harassing me. Leave me alone. And I guess that's a death sentence in Staten Island. Because then the officer grabs him around the neck to take him down, compresses his jugular vein so that the blood that he's gotten to his brain cannot leave his brain and go back and flow throughout his body. And it kills him. And of course, he too, not indicted. What did Eric Garner do other than be black and mouth off to a cop? The latter of which may or may not be a smart thing to do, but it is not I would beg to remind you, illegal. And what did Mike Brown do? Let's really ask that question, because I know we think we know, because we've heard so many things, haven't we? When Darren Wilson was not indicted as well in the case out of Ferguson, the story that the DA spun and had been spinning really from the very beginning in collaboration with the officers was that Mike Brown had charged Darren Wilson, and that's why. So in answer to the repeated white question, what did they do to provoke? Well, we think we know Mike Brown punched Officer Darren Wilson through the window of his car. And then after he started to run away, after having been shot in the hand, he turned around and ran, according to the witness, charged at him like a bull. Hmm. Only now we know that the witness who said that, the only witness who said that, wasn't even there. She fabricated being there the day after the killing she had put on her Facebook page, all these incredibly racist rants about Mike Brown and about Ferguson and about black people. And she was involved in helping to raise money for Darren Wilson's defense. And somewhere along the way, she decided that it might really help him if she said that she had seen the whole thing. So she fabricated being there. Oh, and this is important. The prosecutor who put her on the stand in front of the grand jury or in the chair, however they do the grand jury, it's not really a courtroom, right? Yeah, he knew that she was lying, we now know. He admits that he knew her story was false, but he let her testify anyway. That is called suborning perjury. That is something for which a prosecutor should lose his law license and probably be incarcerated. But that is something which is going unpunished. So the only person who said Mike Brown charged Darren Wilson like a bull is a notorious racist and a notorious liar who wasn't even on the scene. 16 out of 29 witnesses said that he was in the process of putting his hands up. Now, that doesn't mean that... That's accurate, witnesses can misperceive, but that's why we have trials in this country. That's why we get indictments and we go to trial and then we put all the witnesses up and they get cross-examined and whatever happens, happens. And it might very well be that Darren Wilson wouldn't have been convicted because it's hard to prove certain things beyond a reasonable doubt when you've got conflicting testimony. But the thing is, in this case, we didn't even get that far because a liar was allowed to testify and mischaracterized the actions of the big, dangerous, hulking black man who Darren Wilson described as a demon. As a demon. What did he do to provoke? Right? Let's just ask ourselves the question, why were so many white folks, because the survey data on this was very clear, why were so many white folks so ready to believe Darren Wilson? Because to look at the research, you would recognize there's a significant racial divide between white folks and pretty much everyone else. Right? White folks overwhelmingly believed Darren Wilson. Now let's just think, Darren Wilson said that Mike Brown charged him, right? It wasn't just this crazy lying witness who said this. It was also the cop said it, right? So let's just, can we just like process this for a second? Because I think we have to sort of ask ourselves why anyone would believe this story. Even if there'd been a witness who was actually on the scene, why would we believe this story? Because what Darren Wilson is asking you to believe is the following that not only did Mike Brown punch him through the window, which may or may not have happened, we don't know, once again, that's why we have trials, but then at some point, we know Darren Wilson shoots Mike Brown in the hand, right? Mike Brown then proceeds to run. Now he's scared, right? He's scared, he's afraid he's gonna get shot again, so he starts to run, and at some point, 40 yards away, Mike Brown says to himself, wait a minute, to hell with that. Why am I running? I think I'll just turn around and charge the cop because I'm sure he doesn't have any more bullets. And even though he's already proven that he's willing to shoot me once, surely he wouldn't do it again. And surely, even though I'm 300 pounds, I'm sure I can cover this 100 feet in like half a second and get to him before he can pull that trigger, right? We're actually having to believe that Mike Brown irrationally, who rationally was running away, that's a rational act when you've been shot, right? And then all of a sudden, however far away, he says, ah, to hell with that. I'm gonna turn around and run through bullets because the law of physics does not apply to my body. The fact that anyone would believe this story is amazing. What it suggests is how easy it is for some in this country to accept the narrative of the big, dangerous, virtually superhuman black man who has to be stopped by any means necessary. The story never made sense. 
But Darren Wilson was able to raise a half a million dollars off that story for his defense, which he doesn't even need now, but he gets to keep. Half a million dollars raised online to support him. Right? So what did Mike Brown really do? What did Eric Garner do? What did Crawford do? What did Amadou Diallo, Tamir Rice, or any of these folks do? Other than be the wrong color in a country that still suspects blackness and brownness as criminal and deviant. And why did white America believe the officers? Because we don't have a full understanding of this history because it isn't our experience, right? For the vast majority of white folks, that's not what our interactions with law enforcement are like. I know sometimes they are, but for the vast majority, it isn't. And so we have a hard time getting our head around the fact that other people experience this institution, this law enforcement or criminal justice structure in a fundamentally different way. And it's always been this way, this denial, right? Go back to the mid-90s, the O.J. Simpson trial, and by that I mean the first one, because I know there have been a couple of them now. But the one where he was on trial for murder, right, and he was acquitted in the murder of his ex-wife and also Ron Goldman in L.A. And as you'll recall, if you remember those days, and if you don't, you'll just have to take my word for it, there was a huge racial divide in how people saw the outcome of the case. Two out of three African-American folks thought that it was a just verdict when he was acquitted. Didn't mean they thought O.J. was innocent. Right? Doesn't mean that two out of three black folks necessarily thought he was innocent. A lot of black folks were like, yeah, I sort of think he did it. But they didn't prove their case, and there's a burden, and that's the system, and by God, that's the way it works. And two out of three white folks were like, what in the world? This is the craziest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is an injustice, an outrage. Like it was the first time that the justice system had ever broken down in the history of America was when O.J. walked. There was a guy literally on like CNN um, I think it was, either, it was either at the time of the verdict or it might have been on the one-year anniversary they were interviewing him. I can't recall. I think it was the one-year anniversary. So that would have been October of 96. And they're interviewing this guy. And a year later, this white dude is crying. Like he's still crying, right? Tears flowing down his face. And the interviewer has the mic in it. And he says, it just, it just goes to show that everything they taught me in the third grade about this being the greatest justice system in the history of the world. It was all a lie. <laughs> and I remember thinking, God, you know, I mean, I can make fun of him now because it's been a minute. He's probably healed from his existential angst, but <laughs> I felt bad for him in the moment because I thought, God, man, if you had just known some black people, they could have set your ass straight by the time you were like 11. They taught you that when you were eight. You could have had, you'd have been done with that in three years if you had known any people of color. But you had the luxury of believing the system was fair. See, that's what whiteness will do to you. It'll make you think the world looks like this and operates like this when the world actually operates like this. Whiteness will do some crazy thing to the brains of so-called white people. It'll trick you into believing you actually understand the country you live in as opposed to the one you actually live in, which doesn't look like that at all. So all these people, what did they do other than be black, going back to these shootings? Because let me just be clear how I know this about race. In the last year, and you should look these up as well, all these black folks who were told did something to provoke police, did something aggressive and brought it upon themselves, there have been at least a dozen cases in the last year of white folks who have done very aggressive things, very much so against law enforcement and have lived to tell the tale. Let me give you a few examples. In Michigan last year, Dairy Queen, there's a white guy standing outside a Dairy Queen with a loaded rifle, cussing at the cops, refusing to show the cops his ID, refusing to put his gun down, telling the cops that he has a right to threaten their family's lives if he wishes, and then he yells that the revolution is coming. They do not shoot him. They do not attack him. They do not punch him. They arrest him for public drunkenness without incident, without injury. The next day after he sobered up in the drunk tank, they give him his gun back. How very kind. Right. That's one case. In San Diego last year, a white man with a 9 millimeter points that gun at cops and children in a local park. At one point, he rushes toward the officers with the 9 pointed at them and a police copter circling overhead. And he is shot, but in the stomach, right? Shot in the stomach. He falls to the ground. He's not dead. He's injured. His gun is on the ground within reach. They do not rush in. They do not shoot him again to make sure that he is immobilized or dead, having threatened them or possibly being able to threaten them again. They do not rush in and kick him or beat him with batons or anything else. What they do is they call him on his cell phone, which he had in his pocket. They're like, pick up. 
And he's like, oh, what do you want? <laughs> like, we'd like for you to give up. <laughs> They're negotiating on dude's cell phone, and he was pointing a nine at them and at children in New Hampshire. An individual also white fires a BB gun at police. Now, I know BB guns won't kill you, but like my mama told me, they will put your eye out. And that individual wasn't shot, he wasn't beaten, he was not kicked or batoned. In Idaho, two men go into a Walmart and shoot that Walmart up with a BB gun, actually go up to one of the clerks and ask, hey, you wanna shoot up the store? Brrr. The cops come and they arrest him without incident in Pennsylvania. A white man pulls a gun on state police after driving his car into a ditch. They don't shoot him. In Chattanooga, Tennessee last month, they White woman drives around the neighborhood, that's outside of Chattanooga actually, in a suburban area outside of Chattanooga, drives around her neighborhood shooting at everything, shooting at neighbors, shooting at mailboxes, shooting at animals. When she takes the cops on a 70 mile an hour speed chase, she starts shooting at them. They don't shoot her. They don't beat her. I'm not saying they should have, by the way. What I'm trying to suggest to you is these are cops showing restraint in the face of truly aggressive, dangerous, potentially life-threatening behavior exhibited by white people being held to a very different standard. But best case of all, New Orleans last April, White man suspected armed robber is cornered by three members of the New Orleans Police Department. This white guy has a gun pointed at these three members of the New Orleans Police Department. Now, I just want you to understand, if you don't know anything about aggressive policing or racism, just Google New Orleans Police Department and every damn thing will become clear to you, I promise. And so here's this white man with a gun pointed at the cops, three cops with their guns pointed at him. And they say to him, Sir, drop your weapon. Okay, here's the deal. Like, if you don't know what white privilege is, write that shit down, because that's white privilege. The fact that they said to him, drop your weapon, sir, is all you need to know about white privilege, because if you're a black man suspected of armed robbery with a gun pointed at three cops in the city of New Orleans, or I would dare say in the city of Portland, you are dead. You are no longer a carbon-based life form in the morning. But here's this white man, gun pointed at the cops, cops' guns pointed at him, drop your weapon. He does not drop his weapon. Indeed, you know what he does? He looks at the cops and here's what he says, get ready for this, get ready for this. He says, no, you drop your effing gun. <laughs> really? You drop your effing gun and still they do not shoot him. They say, no, you, really. And then he's like, no, you first. They're like, no, you. We would really appreciate it if you would. No, you should. No, I'm going to shoot you. No, we're going to shoot you. But they're not really. And they end up taking him without incident. Last year, Eric Frine up in Pennsylvania shoots a member of the Pennsylvania Highway Patrol. Then he runs off to the woods and hides for three months until they catch him. He's already killed a cop now. He's already demonstrated that he's willing to kill a cop. They do not kill him. They take him without incident. He had a scratch on his face, but the cops didn't even give that to him. He ran into a tree. Case after case after case after case. So when people suggest that these dead black and brown folks did something to provoke, we got to ask why these living white folks who did a lot to provoke many of the very same things, far more aggressive and dangerous than what any of those black men I just mentioned did, are still with us today. That is what we as white Americans have to ask ourselves if we're going to break through this problem of denial, sometimes simply being a person of color is sufficient, but it's not just with regard to the killing of individuals, it's not just with regard to police brutality, it's also with regard to lower level law enforcement. It's also true with regard to stop and frisk and racial profiling. We know, for instance, that in New York City where stop and frisk has theoretically been eliminated, it certainly has dropped off since uh, the new mayor became mayor, but over the time when it was in force, well over two and a half million stops over a five or six year period under review. Of those, 88% of those individuals stopped were folks of color, overwhelmingly African Americans. In less than 5% of the cases was anyone arrested or even given a ticket for anything, which is to say that almost all of the stops and frisks were unjustified by any criminal activity or else they would have been arrested. They would have gotten a ticket. It's sort of like the young man who brought me out to Portland many years ago to Lewis and Clark, young black man. I think he was a junior at the time. And as we're coming back from PDX to get to the school, he'd been, you know, in Portland for a couple of years. He wasn't from here. And he asked me, how many times do you think I've been stopped by the Portland police in this vehicle in the two and a half years that I've been here in Portland? I said, I don't know. He said, I've been stopped like 37 times. I said, how many times have you gotten a ticket? He said, none. 
See, what does that tell you? When you get stopped 37 times and they never give you a ticket, that's because you didn't do anything, right? That's because they weren't looking for any criminal activity. They had no lead on anything. They had no reason. I mean, if it just happened once or twice, it might be that they're being nice and it's a warning. Just be good. You know, don't drive so fast. You know, turn on your blinker. But if they stop you 37 times and you never got a ticket, that is racial profiling. That is stop and frisk. That is low level but quite real police harassment. So back to New York. In New York, less than 2% of the stops resulted in the confiscation of drugs, although that was one of the primary reasons given for the program. We're gonna get drugs off the street. Less than 2% of the time did they find any. Less than 2 tenths of 1% of the time did they find weapons. And that was the number one justification given by the former mayor and the former police chief. This is how we're getting guns off the street. What the hell? Two tenths of a percent of the time you found a weapon. I could do better getting guns off the street just walking down the middle of Broadway in Times Square and just tagging people. Right? I could just like roll a bowling ball down the street and whoever it touched, you'd have to like show me. You got a gun? Yeah, I got one. I could do better than two tenths of one percent just randomly guessing. So that's not a gun reduction program. That's not a drug confiscation program. It was about controlling black bodies. And it's very ironic because according to the research, even though they were far less likely to stop white people, the white folks they did stop were far more likely to actually have contraband on them, right? So black and brown folks more likely to get stopped, white folks more likely to be guilty on the occasions when we were stopped. Same thing is true nationally. Justice Department data says black men and Latino men two to three times more likely to be stopped and searched, their vehicles and their bodies searched by officers, even though white folks on the occasion that they're stopped are three to four times more likely to actually have the stuff on us. That's a system of inequality. And I gotta tell you, like, I didn't actually need the statistics to know that the war on drugs was racist and more to the point that it wasn't about drugs. I knew that from personal experience, and I can confess that to you now because the statute of limitations has expired. <laughs> I can assure you that if the war on drugs were about drugs, I don't really know who would be giving this speech to you today, <laughs> but I'm really confident that it wouldn't be me because I don't think they would have let me Skype it in from prison, which is where I would have been had the war on drugs actually been about that. But see, some of us, and I'm not trying to glamorize drug use, by the way. Don't. Just say no. Just say no. Like I, and my asthma came back, so I'm done with all that. So don't even ask. I'm just saying. Like, but, but some of us are able to take advantage and push that envelope in ways that others are not. Right? And that, too, is a uh, clear evidence of systemic injustice. In fact, a couple months ago, about six weeks ago now, I guess, actually, I crunched these numbers looking at CDC data on drug use, looking at FBI data on drug arrest and incarceration, and I was able to sort of go through all these numbers and figure out that if, in fact, arrest rates for drug use were consistent with actual rates of drug use, that is to say, if white folks and if black folks, for instance, were arrested in percentage and in relation to their rates of using and thereby possessing actual illegal narcotics, there would be roughly 160,000 more white folks every year who would be arrested for drugs, and there would be 160,000 fewer African Americans arrested each year. So there would be a shift in 320, I mean, just imagine what that would do to the justice system, to have a shift of 320,000 people a year in terms of who has a record now and who doesn't, who's going to jail and who wouldn't, who's going to lose their right to vote at least for a minute and who's not, who's going to lose their right to various forms of government assistance and scholarships to college, right? 160,000 more white folks getting arrested for drugs each year, you know what? The war on drugs would stop. It would have stopped because you're not going to have all those white parents letting their babies go to jail and lose their college scholarships, right? So 160, I mean, that, that, the, 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 literally the white privilege and racism within the war on drugs is so severe that if it weren't for that, there wouldn't be a war on drugs, right? That's how deep that runs. And yet we still maintain this persistent denial and very little of the civil rights victories that we commemorate at a time like this have been able to touch any of that. It's interesting to ask why it is that we're so oblivious to this data and these facts and the lived reality of people of color. And the only thing that I can conclude and have been able to conclude, because I still believe that the vast majority of white Americans are decent people, I don't believe that the vast majority of white Americans wake up seeking to oppress people. 
just like I don't think the vast majority of men wake up seeking to engage in institutional misogyny, but we are caught up in a system that encourages us to do just that, subsidizes that, encourages that, and makes that not only possible, but very likely. But in spite of the fact that I think most people are good, in fact, maybe it's because I think most people are decent that we're in trouble, right? Because see, the problem is when you're a good person, and by that I mean a caring, compassionate person that doesn't want to hurt someone else, sometimes you have a hard time looking at the pain, right? Sometimes that's the very thing that makes it harder for you to deal with pain and injustice because you're so caring and you're so compassionate, you don't want to see the ugly. Right? It's almost easier to look at the ugly when you're a sociopath, right? Or to look at the ugly when you're an antisocial personality, when you're someone who actually doesn't mind pain, actually might like pain, actually doesn't have a problem with pain. You want to look at pain when you're that person. You don't have a problem seeing it. Now, you might not do anything about it because of that particular antisocial personality, but... But for people who are caring and compassionate and not antisocial in their orientation, they are likely to look at the pain and go, oh, my God, I don't, I don't want to dwell on that, right? Especially because if you're a good person and you look at the ugly too long, what do you have to do as a good person? Now you know you're morally obligated to do something about it. So now you're on the hook. And being on the hook takes time. Being on the hook takes work. Being on the hook means now you got to do something. And you only got 24 hours in a day and seven days in a week and 365 in most years, one extra day every four. That's not enough if you got a busy schedule. So it's almost like we turn away from it, not in spite of being good, but because we're mostly caring and compassionate. Sometimes nice, caring, compassionate, decent white liberal folk are the biggest problem of all. Right? It's not the right-wingers who say they want their country back. They telegraph what they're looking at. They make it very clear what they're about, and they're a lot easier to fight because of it. But the folks who act like there's nothing wrong because they don't want to look at the ugly or they don't want to look at the downside of gentrification of certain neighborhoods like this one, Because we don't want to look at it because then we're implicated. Then the fact that we moved into the neighborhood means now we got to do some work in it. Oh, man, I thought I could just move there. I thought I could just move there and sign up for Pilates and get my organic food right down there on the corner and have some hipster coffee or whatever and a craft beer joint or whatever, right? Nothing wrong with that stuff, by the way. I mean, you know, Pilates is good. I can't do it, but it's cool. Um, craft beer is really good, uh, organic food, that's cool. But, you know, when you come into a neighborhood, right, and you see the devastation that has been wrought in a space systemically over many generations, you got to get active and helping to work on that. It's not that people don't want you to come in, but they want you to come in on their terms, not your terms, right? You want to come in and be a part of the lifeblood of that community? You want to come in and actually work to improve the services and the systems and the institutions in that community, you will generally be welcomed in with open arms. You want to come in and reshape the community and change the way it looks? That is a bigger problem, but good people don't want to look at that. They don't want to look at the devastation, let alone get active fixing it, and the same is true with the justice system. So what I've come to realize is that the biggest problem with whiteness is not that it engenders bigotry and hatred and overt racism, I mean, you know, it might encourage that in some people, but for most people, we don't go down that road. What we do go down is the road of pure obliviousness to everything that's happening. Just this invisibility of what's happening. Now, it's a learned invisibility. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's a cultivated ignorance. It's a cultivated obliviousness. I'm not saying we're innocent for it. I'm just saying, sort of like that movie, The Matrix, right? So if you've seen The Matrix, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, you should, and you should watch it through a racial lens if you get a chance because it's fascinating, right? In the film, there's a scene early on, sort of sets the tone for the film, where Lawrence Fishburne's character, Morpheus, offers uh, Keanu Reeves' character, Neo, two pills. One is red, one is blue, right? And he says, you can take the blue pill if you want. You can go back to sleep. I'm paraphrasing here, but it's basically the gist of it. You can go back to sleep. That's what everybody else is doing. They don't want to see it. In fact, they don't want to see it so badly, they're willing to die not to have to look at it. So you can take the pill, and you don't have to know what's going on. You can go back to sleep and be oblivious to everything that's going on around you, just like everyone else. Or you can take the red pill and have enlightenment, and I can take you down the rabbit hole, and I can show you just how deep it goes, and you'll be able to see all these things that everyone else is missing. And, of course, Neo takes the red pill, and he begins to see all of these things. It's almost like a perfect, a perfect analogy for how we address race in this country. For those of us who are members of the dominant group, 
For those of us called white in a system of white supremacy, it's as if we are taking the blue pill all the time. Maybe you don't even know we're taking it, man, walking around with a blue pill IV drip sticking out of our veins. Like schlepping around that IV tube, don't even know, like, what the hell is that? I don't know what, why I got this tube. What is that blue shit going through the tube? I don't even know what that is. And people of color are like, don't you see all this? Don't you see the racism? They're like, no, nah, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And people of color are like, red pill, red pill, take the damn red pill. We're like, no, we're on the blue. We're, 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 I like the blue, see? <laughs> and this is true in other binaries as well, right? I mean, men have the luxury of taking the blue pill, and I know it means different things in the modern era to say that, right? I know, I know, right? See, everybody gets that joke. It's, that's how good Pfizer is with their marketing, man. That is capitalism right there. That is, that is straight up capitalist manipulation of your consciousness. But in any event, men have the luxury of taking that matrix blue pill with regard to sexism and patriarchy, rape culture, misogyny. Straight folk and cisgendered folk have the luxury of taking the blue pill and going back to sleep on straight supremacy, heteronormativity, transphobia, etc. Right? Those of us with money, we have the luxury of ignoring the poor and the lives of poor people because we're on the blue pill, they're on the red. They gotta see the class system because it's killing them. Those of us who are able-bodied, we have the luxury of sleeping on how our disabled brothers and sisters experience life. We don't have to take the red pill that they gotta take just to figure out how to navigate the spaces within which they find themselves and the day-to-day -day routine of school or work or what have you, right? This is the luxury and also the horror of being the dominant group, is that when you're the dominant group, even if you're infinitely good in terms of your intentionality and in terms of your ethics, your morals, your human decency, you have the incredibly great likelihood of going to sleep on what other people have to see and being convinced that it isn't happening. But let's ask ourselves, what are the odds that the people who have to see the system in order to survive it are misinterpreting their own lives? What are the odds that the people who have to see the things that are happening by, beyond the obvious and behind the curtain, so to speak, are misinterpreting their lives. And what are the odds that those of us who have the luxury of the blue pill and go into sleep in spite of that are able to see those other folks' lives more clearly than they themselves see their lives? I would say that's very, very unlikely. In fact, to suggest such a thing is to denigrate the intelligence of those who are being marginalized. It is to say, I know your reality better than you know your reality, so trust me and not your lying eyes. I'm not sure what we could say that would be more racist than that, or sexist than that, or straight supremacist than that, or classist than that, or ableist than that. To say as a member of a dominant group, I know you better than you know you is to say that you're either too emotional, too overwrought, too irrational, too unintelligent to even interpret your basic daily reality. We ought to be offended by that in general, but when we add this to the mix, right, that becomes an oppressive stance. So we have to stop the blue pill IV. We have to be brave enough to take those red pills because those young folks right now who are in the streets of this country, having clearly taken the red pill, they are not unclear, they are not confused, and they are not afraid of what law enforcement could do to them and what this country has knowingly done to others like them, they are willing at the age of 17 and 18 and 19 and 20, 21, 22, young people are willing to take a stand because their lives are at risk. They're trying to convince us that black lives matter even as all the evidence from our history tells us that black and brown lives mean very little to an awful lot of people in this country. If we are going to change that, we have to begin to see this and we have to be able to see it with our eyes wide open and the IV drip of the blue pill ripped out of our veins because this is making it impossible to attain our country. Whatever you take that to mean, as James Baldwin said, right, we have the opportunity to attain our country, but we are not even remotely there and we cannot get there as a people if we're not willing to understand the vast differential in daily lived experience between peoples on the basis of these arbitrary identities like color and gender and sex, sexuality, class, and all of these things that we've used as ways to divide people. We have to join with those young people and we certainly don't need to lecture them anymore. The thing that's been so distressing in the wake of the post-Ferguson movement and the Black Lives Matter movement, which is led by such incredibly brave, courageous people, is how quick some of us who've been at this for a minute have been to 
critique their efforts, right? And to tell them they're doing it wrong, right? And maybe we mean, well, I'm not always certain, right? But we say things like, you're not doing it the way we used to do it. Why you gotta wear your pants like that? Why you gotta dress like that? Why you gotta listen to that music? Why don't you put on a suit and tie? Why don't the ladies put on dresses and do it the way we did it in the old days? That didn't save anybody, right? Women in dresses got beaten by cops. John Lewis in a suit and tie got beaten by cops. Dr. King in a suit and tie got shot and dropped. So respectability politics means absolutely nothing in a system of white supremacy. The idea that you can put on a respectable veneer and white supremacy will not come for you has never been true at any time. It is not true now. This is not about respectability. This is about inequality. This is not about what young people provoke from the cops. This is what a system of injustice provokes from young people. And if we are not ready, if we are not ready to put ourselves on the line, we're in no position to lecture other people about the process by which they call for justice. So we need to be joining with them. We need to be working with them, building community with them, offering our support, whether it's moral or strategic or financial or all of those things to these folks who are brave enough to get out there and demand that we're capable of better. And you see, I know that for some people, it's always fascinated me, right? That when you stand up and you criticize the United States of America for its fundamentally unjust history and its ongoing unjust contemporary reality, there always will be people who will suggest that you are hateful toward the country, that you don't love the country, that you're cynical about the country. But it always has struck me that the people who are truly cynical about the potentiality of this place that we call home are the people who believe that we have reached the promised land and have no more work to do. What could be more cynical than that? What could be more cynical than to say the best that we can do is seven million people locked up, uh, two and a half million locked up, seven million on probation, parole or locked up, a disproportionate number of them people of color. Who but a cynic would say that was okay? Who but a cynic who didn't really believe in the people of the country would say that the typical white family having 20 times the wealth of the typical black family, 18 times that of the typical Latino family was as good as we could do. Who but a cynic would say that we can't do any better than black and brown folks twice as likely as white folks to be unemployed even when they have the same education. Who but a cynic would give up on the potential for progress and moving forward to justice and throw their hands up and say, oh well, we tried and we just can't get it any better. See, I think it's time we flip the script on this narrative of who really loves the people of this country and who really loves this place that we call home. It is not those who would give up on the struggle for justice and call the game over. It is those of us who continue to do the work, those of you who I know will continue to do the work. And I thank you very much for being here today and hanging out with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I know some of you probably have to get to another class or whatever, that's cool. We're gonna do some questions and answers though. If you do have to leave, just do it as quietly as you can so that when we bring the mic around and do the Q&A, everybody can be heard who wants to be heard. Before we do any questions though, I do wanna make an announcement, uh, something I was alerted to before uh, I began. So in keeping with this idea that we have to have these dialogues even when they're very uncomfortable, and push them into space that may not be the easiest space. Um, I do wanna thereby alert you to this uh, effort that uh, is gonna be happening here as part of a larger effort, Race Talks, Uniting to Break the Chains of Racism, an Opportunity for Dialogue. It's a larger program that's gonna have several events, um, but there is one in particular that is a community police forum, and it is gonna be held on at, at the Jefferson High School cafeteria on the third of February, that's Tuesday, February 3rd. It will be dinner, a free dinner at 5.30. The program from six o'clock to nine o'clock, free childcare will be provided. Um, there will be wheelchair access uh, to the building across from the parking lot. Let me just read you the description. It is to improve communication between the police and the public. Race Talks 2 is working in cooperation with the, is this Albina Ministerial Alliance? Is that the right pronunciation? Um, and the Portland Police Bureau to sponsor a series of community police forums. Events will be held monthly at different locations, posted on our Facebook page and social justice alerts. Come let us know what's on your mind 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So dinner at 5.30, program six to nine. And then for those who, I, who would like more information, I guess about the, the larger program, um, I'm seeing if there's a, if there's a uh, website. There, there looks like there's a Facebook page, and I guess it's Race Talks uh, is the Facebook page. I don't see a other website, but anyway. If you're interested in that, please go to that. The more people who come, the more people who express their really uh, serious concerns about over-policing and inequality in the law enforcement of, uh, of Portland, the more people who do that, the better. Um, it's important to hear as many stories, as many narratives, as many truths as possible in that kind of space. So anyway, thank you all again for being here. So if there are questions, we've got a couple of different mics. We'll bring them to you. Um, yes, we'll start back there. That'll be great. Whoever's got one, yes. Hi. Hi. Can, okay, so um, first of all, I just want to say thanks for coming. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you if you could, um, I'm originally from East St. Louis area, mm -hmm. and I've lived other places, and I have to say that um, I'd like to know what you think. I personally think Portland is like the worst <laughs> when it comes to racism mm -hmm. because it's hidden. And in East St. Louis, you know, growing up as a child, you know, you knew what it was yeah. um, but I've found this place to be extremely um, oppressive yeah. and I wanted to know as far as what do you think um, about Portland Portland Oregon like right. is there hope like I want to know like you're far more <laughs> I'm serious right. it's real right it's real right well let me say this um, and I would say it about most any place I've been I love a lot of things about this area and I love a lot of things about this city, mostly the people that I've met and many of the activists over the years that I've met are just incredible folks. So any place where there are so many incredible folks, I have hope for. Um, having said that, I see fully with as much clarity as I as a white man can what you're talking about. Because I remember the first time that I came up here, it was also the same month that I went for the first time to Seattle. And I had a very blinkered and naive view about both places. Now, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. I've lived in the South all my life and went to New Orleans for college. And I remember thinking that the hype about Portland and Oregon generally and the hype about Seattle and Washington generally was true. So I was quite stunned to get out here and hear many of the stories that I began to hear, including that one from that young black man that I mentioned earlier who brought me to Lewis. And I wasn't stunned by what he said in terms of it being true, but I was just stunned in the sense that I had to really rethink, right, the image that I'd been given of the city and of the state. And, uh, and so I think that the point you're getting at to me conjures up something I hear all over the country from people of color who are in these ostensibly progressive places and they may be progressive in relation to certain issues. They may be progressive just in terms of, I guess, on election day, who gets the vote in those areas. But that doesn't always mean very much. Um, they may be progressive in terms of, um, you know, certain issues, ecological and environmental issues, certain other issues. But uh, when it comes to race, right, and when it comes to class, they're oftentimes very much no better and occasionally worse precisely for their invisibility of those issues than the places where it is more blatant. And there's a reason, and I want us all to really understand this. You know, everybody asks me, do I think racism's worse in the Northeast or the Northwest or the Midwest or the South? And I don't really get into that kind of comparison because I don't think it's very helpful and I don't know if there's any objective way to do it. But I will say, I don't think it's any different quantitatively. It just looks different qualitatively. Right. So I've always lived in places where just as with East St. Louis, Illinois, which even though folks, if you've never been there, even though it's Illinois, that's the South. All right. Just like St. Louis wants to be gateway to the Midwest. Yeah, whatever. That's the South. Right. St. Louis is the South. It's the most southern city ever to call itself something other than that. Um, and East St. Louis, Illinois, same thing. Uh, those of us who come from the South. know When racism is present, because there's a there's a look there's a sound, there's a smell, there's a everything, like you know it, and you've been trained to know it. And there's a reason that black folks all around the country are moving back south in large numbers, sort of a reverse of the great migration. There were several great migrations in the 20th century, and now you're starting to see, it, and, and a lot of times white folks don't understand this. They're like, why would you move to Atlanta or Charlotte or back to you know uh, New Orleans or back south? And the answer is very much 
along the lines of what you're implying, right, which is at least in those places, I know where I stand and I know what it looks like. And therefore, I have some some ways to respond or to defend myself from it, as opposed to the sort of invisible uh, aspect of, of microaggressions and racism in a place like Portland, which is just death by a thousand cuts, right? Death by a thousand cuts. You may not have as many overtly racist incidents, though, don't bet on it, but you'll have enough of those microaggressions that after a while they begin to build up, and precisely because white folks in other parts of the country don't know this language like we do. Those of us from the South, they don't see it. Like, at least if I, look, if I speak at the University of Alabama, Ain't nobody in that audience in, in denial that race is an issue. Nobody, even the white folks that hate every fiber of my being and don't like anything that I said. None of them are out there going, well, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> well, that's the craziest racism. What? I need to look that up. I don't even know what it is. Like, they all know. Like, they know. They'll, they'll be the ones that are like, yeah, I don't like black people. Okay, thank you for, for letting me know that. Like, I knew that already because the Confederate flag you had on your hat. Like, I already knew. But thank you for the clarification, right? So, but at least there, right, at least there, they all know the language. They don't look at me like I'm from Neptune. But when I come to the Northwest, if I come to the West Coast generally, if I go up East, if I go to, the, you know, Minnesota, nice Minnesota, friendly Minnesota, right? Everybody's so nice and sweet there. They don't, you know, they're, they're so used to not looking at the ugly. We've always had to look at the ugly in the South. And I would say that gives us a leg up. And that's why most of the freedom struggle leadership and, and activists that have changed this country for the better to the extent that we have, they've come out of the South. There's a reason why. It doesn't mean that those of you who aren't from the South don't have a role to play, but you just better learn to follow Southern folk because we know how to create a justice movement because we've been dealing with systemic injustice for a very long time and we are not blinkered or naive any longer about it in our own communities, right? Other questions? <clears throat> yes, over there. Hi, again, thank you for being here today. Um, I interpreted your use of the term whiteness to be very negative, and I was just wondering and curious, are you ashamed of your skin color and of being part of the white community? Not at all, um, not at all. I don't believe that I am a member of the white community because I insist there is no such thing as the white community. If, if, as James Baldwin said, As James Baldwin said, so long as you think you're white, there is no hope for you. And I would reiterate that. Those of us called white are called that for a reason. And it isn't because that is a real thing biologically. It is not. It is not a real thing genetically. It is not a real thing culturally. The white race didn't exist insofar as we use that term until the middle of the 1600s to the late part of the 17th century. That is not what our people were called in the countries from which we come. Uh, we were not white before, we were English, we were Scottish, we were German, we were Russian, we were Italian, whatever it is that we were. Whiteness, and the reason that I speak about it in terms that you find negative, is because whiteness has never been anything but negative. Whiteness has never been, <laughs> whiteness is a, is, a, is a trick. And that doesn't mean white people have been nothing but negative. Those of us called white can't help that that's the name they gave us or that we chose and then put on ourselves. But whiteness as a concept was only created for one reason. And the reason it was created was for the purpose of maintaining a system of subordination over anyone who wasn't classified as white. So why would I have positive regard for whiteness if the history of whiteness is only that? There's no other, like none of the great things that Europeans have done, and Europeans have done lots of wonderful things, just like lots of awful things, just like people from all over the world have done both. We all have done great and lots of horror. But the things that Europeans did that maybe we can be rightly proud of, those were not white things. Those were the things that they did as members of whatever community they happened to be a part of. So all the good things that white, quote unquote, white folks have done ain't about whiteness, and all the stuff that's about whiteness ain't good. Like, so, so, so when I speak of whiteness, yes, I think of it as a negative thing because I don't know of any positive aspect of that terminology or that concept. That has nothing to do, however, with the people called white. If I did not believe that the people called white, including myself, were capable of better, 
I would not waste my breath or y'all's time. Just like if I didn't think that the country were capable of better, which I made the point there at the end of the talk, I wouldn't waste my breath or y'all's time. It is precisely because I think whiteness not only hurts people of color who don't qualify for that designation, I think it damages white people. Like I said, it leads us to believe A is true when actually B is true. It leads us to not see the world for what it is. So I'm actually resentful of whiteness because of what it does to me. I'm resentful of whiteness because of what it does to my children. I'm resentful of whiteness because it leads young children to believe that this inequality that they see is natural and that it's acceptable and that it's justified and can be rationalized. So to me, I don't think whiteness has done European people in the long run a lot of favors. It has certainly set us up relative to people of color, but I would say in the long run, it isn't a very positive uh, thing. What it has done historically is it has pitted us against one another. So most quote unquote white people are harmed by white supremacy. How? Well, because what it does, a couple of different ways historically, is it has kept working people at each other's throats, right? So throughout history, working class European people were led to believe that, yeah, you might not have much, but at least you're not black, or at least you're not Mexican, or at least you're not Native American. So you don't have a pot to piss in? No, you don't. You don't own any land? No, you don't. But we're going to fight this civil war, and we're going to have y'all poor white folks go out and fight to maintain us rich white folks' property, and y'all be the ones that get shot, and y'all get to be the ones who die. Y'all, because the rich weren't going to do it, because rich white Southerners were the laziest people ever to come down the pike. They prided themselves. They prided themselves on not working. Th their words, not mine. They prided themselves on being people of leisure who didn't have to work. That's why they got other people to do the work for them. And when they broke away from the union, they said it was about white supremacy. They said that was the only reason. That was the cornerstone of their government. They gave no other reason at all. And then poor white folks got suckered into going out and fighting to help rich white folks. What's that? That's whiteness tricking you into believing that you're going to be a plantation owner. When you're going to be nothing, you're going to stay poor. They're going to keep kicking your butt just like they're kicking their butt. They may kick theirs first, but they're coming for you. And then the same thing happens in the 30s. You got, you got white union leaders who tell working class white people, oh, we don't want to integrate the union because if you get those black people and those Chinese people and those Mexican people in your union, it'll destroy the professionalism of your craft. No fool, it will double the size of your union. It will double the size of your union. So why... Why did you have white union folks who were fought militantly to keep people of color out? Because whiteness had convinced them that they were better off throwing down with the boss than they were throwing down with brothers and sisters who were of color. So whiteness has done white folks no favors in the long run, and I think it is incumbent upon all white folks to reject whiteness and to choose humanity because those two things are not going to be compatible as we move forward. Trust me on that. Next question. I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. You got, you got the mic and then we'll come here. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Good afternoon to you. I do want to ask you, um, I'm wondering who or what has influenced you to do this work and when did you choose to do this work? And additional, I'm noticing that uh, white people are having a negative reaction to the word anti-racist. Have you noticed that? And, then, and if you have noticed that, why do you think that is the case? Well. The why piece is hard. I'll, I'll do the last part of the question first. Some white folks are having a hard time with the term anti-racist, and in part it's because there's been a very concerted effort by a small but incredibly vocal group of white supremacists on the internet to spread virally this meme, you know, that you've probably seen or heard. It's a 242-word mantra that was developed by an overt white supremacist, really a neo-Nazi. Um, who denies that, but his whole history is that. And it's a group of people who spread this 242 word mantra about how anti-racist is just a code for anti-white, you know. And then they sometimes break it down just to that sentence. It's 242 words, there's a lot of other nonsense in it, but they, they sometimes distill it to that. And they'll post this everywhere. They are, they are, it's amazing to me that members of a master race apparently don't have jobs, so they spend all day they just spend all day posting the mantra everywhere. They're not working. How is that possible for the master race? How can they not be working? So all day long, they go, they'll go on Amazon and any book that is about race, they'll just, oh, anti-racist is anti-white. It's just, it's like a, it's like a, a, a Amkara for them. It's like, a, it's like a serenity prayer for someone in AA. Like they just keep saying it over and over again. And then they'll go every YouTube video. Oh my God, they'll post it a hundred times. And then they'll brag. We posted the mantra 500 times 
times today. Rah! You know, it's just this cult-like behavior, but it works because you've heard about it, I'm sure, and, and many of you have probably seen it. So I think that's getting around and, and, and causing people who aren't assessing these things very critically to maybe believe some of that. Um, I also maybe think it's because anti-racist isn't always the best word. I'm not even real comfortable with the term sometimes because, um, you know, to define yourself by what you're against is you know, somewhat limiting. And so even though I use the term anti-racism activist or anti-racism educator, and I've shifted to that more than anti-racist, because again, it's really about racism as a system as opposed to racist as people. Um, anti-racism is still not really making it clear what we're for. And so obviously at some point we do want to get to a different kind of term, you know, whether it's racial justice or equity, I don't know, like liberation, I don't know what the term is, right? But I guess at least at, in the current, even though it's an imperfect term, which even I'm not totally thrilled with, it's the one that at least lets you know sort of what we're talking about for the most part, unless you're one of those Nazis who's convinced that it's a call for white genocide or something, which is, their, which is part of their mantra, that, you know, that we're trying to genocide white people. Um, you know, which is exactly what I, as a white person with a white wife, white children, white mom, white dad, and lots of white friends would be looking to do, would be to exterminate myself. <laughs> um, you know, but whatever. And, and so there's that. Now, the other piece, as far as what, uh, you know, what inspired me to do the work or whatever, how did I get started doing the work? Um, there are a lot of different entry points for that along the way. I mean, some of it is my, my own sort of parental situation. My, my mom, the way I was brought up, uh, by my parents, my mom mostly, my dad too, but my mom mostly influential. Um, just certain things, I mean, my mom wasn't an activist, she wasn't a radical, she wasn't steeped in this kind of theory in the early 70s, she hadn't been in the movement, though she had been supportive of it, she was a little too young to have been actively involved. Um, but she made certain decisions about like where I would go to school, I was you know, in a preschool program that was at a historically black college, so almost all of my earliest friends and peers were African-American kids. And I'm not saying that like, I know all white people say they have black friends, I know. And, <laughs> and we're usually lying. But, um, but in my case, that's like all I had for a couple of years there uh, were, were pretty much black friends. And then the, the authority figures in that program were mostly black women. So what that meant, right, I was three, three and a half years old, four years old. And think about that, like in 1972, even today, but especially in 1972, to be subordinated to black authority at the age of three and a half or four, it's pretty heavy, right? Because it teaches you to respect black authority so that then 20 something years later, when in my case, I was doing community organizing and public housing projects in New Orleans, and I'm working mostly with African-American women who were like the leaders of those communities, um, and they're telling me what their life is like. I'm going back to that early conditioning where I learned to respect black women's authority and black people generally. I'm not gonna be the white guy who looks at them and says, are you sure about that? Are you sure that thing really happened? Are you sure you're not playing a race card or exaggerating the problem or seeing things, you know? Um, maybe I'm more objective than you because I'm not from here. You know, I wasn't going to be that guy. I was going to be the guy who assumed, oh, you know, she probably knows what she's talking about. And having had those friends, it meant that as we came through school and they got treated differently, right? Tracked low while the white kids were tracked high. Disciplined more harshly, even though we all broke the rules the same way it meant that I was gonna notice that because I was getting separated from my friends. Other white kids maybe wouldn't have noticed it, not because they were racist, horrible people, but just because they didn't know those kids, so it wouldn't have meant a lot to them. So I think that was instrumental, but for me the real key were the people I met when I got to New Orleans and the mentors that I had, mostly people of color, also a lot of white allies who've been acting in solidarity for a very long time with folks of color, but those mentors, the folks at the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond and others in the city of New Orleans were critical um, to really bringing me along and, and, and supporting me and helping me and correcting me when I needed to be corrected and, and just helping me in every possible way. So um, I would say it's a combination of, you know, parental and the people that you meet along the way. And, uh, and I knew that after being in New Orleans for the time that I was there, I mean, I, I was involved in that, you know, campaigns against um, David Duke in 1990 and 91 when he ran for Senate and ran for governor of Louisiana. And for those who don't remember who David Duke is, it's very lucky, I suppose, that uh, you don't. But uh, probably the country's most prominent overt white supremacist in the last half century, former head of the largest Ku Klux Klan group in the United States, lifelong neo-Nazi, or at least lifelong since maybe the age of 18. Um, and David ran for Senate, and then he ran for governor, and I was involved in the campaigns against him. And, and he lost, you know, um, the people of Louisiana won, and we defeated him. But 
I do remember, you know, after that, I don't know if you all recall that election. You may recall that um, David Duke, although he lost the Senate race, U.S. Senate race, he did get six out of 10 white people to vote for him and 55 out of 100 in the governor's race. So if it weren't for black folks saving us from ourselves and the relatively small statistical handful of Latino and Asian folk in Louisiana doing the same, white folks were ready to send a Nazi to Washington and or Baton Rouge as governor of Louisiana. And I remember sitting there after that election with my thoughts thinking, wow, you know, what does that mean that people who check that census form the same way I do, that they're white, right, are willing to vote for a guy who they know is a Nazi. Because it's not like they didn't know that. It's not like that was a secret. I mean, there were children in utero at the time of the election who knew that this was a Nazi. Like, you know, I mean, even people not born yet knew that this was a Nazi. And, and so everyone knew, and yet six out of 10 white people didn't seem to care. And I remember thinking, wow, what does that mean for me as a white person? Because I couldn't hate those people for that. Right. I had to be humble enough to realize in that moment, my God, I could be them and they could be me. The only thing separating me from them, I'm not better than them. I'm not more moral, more righteous, and I'm not necessarily more intelligent. I'm just a little further down the road on this one thing. And why is that? Because of the experiences I had growing up. I had my parents and they didn't. And that made all the difference. I met those people I met, and they didn't. They met some other folks along the way. So I, I, I didn't deserve my family and my friends and my experiences, and they weren't to blame for theirs. It was just serendipitous and coincidence and good luck that I had come to a place. So I had to be really, you know, compassionate about these people who were ready to send a Nazi to that level of political power by struggling with them. And so I knew in that moment that had to be my work because it wasn't fair to keep asking black and brown folk to bail us out. You know, we like to tell people of color, y'all need to take personal responsibility for yourself. Blah, blah, blah. And yet, when were we gonna take personal responsibility? Because David Duke is our problem, right? White supremacy is our problem. So at some point, if we're gonna preach self-help to other people, we gotta do it. And that was the moment where that became crystal for me. Next question was right over here. I promised you we're gonna come there. Done and done. We'll come over here then. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, what, what can uh, white people do when we see racial profiling happening? Um, take out your camera and start filming it. And don't ever let a cop tell you you're not allowed to film. You are allowed to film. You're not allowed to interfere with their business. But if you're standing at a good enough distance away from them, they have absolutely no. And, and you need to film it on a program that sends it straight to the cloud, right? Because they will confiscate your phone and they will try to delete it. So you need to make sure it's uploading and it's being saved to some program that will be, you know, cloud ready so that you'll have it in case they take your phone. But I'm very serious. We need to be, um, I mean, I'd like to say, do even more direct confrontation, but that's not necessarily going to help that person of color, right? In fact, that could make it worse, you know? And so I think in this case, you want to make it very clear that you're watching. You want to film in the hopes that that will deter a certain type of brutality or misconduct. Um, and you need to, to raise your voice about that. You need to confront that verbally, if you can, with uh, law enforcement, either at the time or later. Uh, when you witness something, you need to go to the police station, precinct, or wherever it is that that officer likely came from and report that to somebody so that they know, not because they're going to do anything about it. I don't expect that they will, but it's very important for white folks to start showing up in police departments to report misconduct by police. Because if the only people calling that in are people of color, if the only people that the cops see complaining are people of color, and we already know that many of them don't care about what people of color have to say, if they start seeing white folks on their door, saying, hey, this is what I saw, this is what I, you know, and I want you to do something about this. It doesn't mean they're necessarily going to do it, but they will have to start, you know, it's one of those ways that we as white folks can put institutions off balance, right? We can sort of shake them up to where they don't know what they can get away with. A lot of what people do that's racist is, is because they think they can get away with it. The reason people tell racist jokes in our presence is because they think we're going to be okay with it. And the minute we we, we bust them for that. They have to start thinking again the next time. And the minute, you know, somebody, they, they do racial profiling because they think nobody other than the victim is going to say anything about it. So we have to be willing to put folks off balance by responding in ways they don't expect. And that means taping. It means speaking out. 
It means going to the police and reporting these things, even when you know it's not likely, at least initially, to get a whole lot done. And it means that we have to be involved in these movements like Black Lives Matter. We have to be involved in these movements that are seeking to address issues of racial profiling and police brutality. And I think we also need to be joining the struggle for civilian review boards and democratically elected uh, police departments. I think that communities need to have the right to decide who is going to police their community. And they ought to be the ones making the decisions about... They ought to be the ones making the decision about who gets hired, who gets fired, who gets promoted. In an ideal world, we would have residency requirements for all police, but I know that in practical terms, it may not be possible in certain communities to make sure that every officer is from that community, but that doesn't mean we can't empower the community to be involved in the decision making. They can be making the decisions by reviewing the people who are possibly going to be hired, and those individuals who want to be hired know that they got to come in and build relationship first before they can be an officer. A lot of what we can do about racial profiling and brutality and all of these things has to happen on the front end before it happens. But the reactive piece would be the filming, the going to the office and, and, and being engaged in protest. Yeah, we'll come down here, yes. Right there. Uh, even uh, when we have uh, officers of color in our own community, um, they have been, um, Uh, chosen to follow against the other police officers. Mm -hmm. So not only do we have white police officers that are racial profiling our our youth out here, Mm -hmm. but we also have officers of color that are doing the same thing to our children. So how do we get them to uh, stop following them and, and stand up and say, this is not okay? No, I think you make a good point. You know, another thing James Baldwin said, talking about growing up in Harlem as he did, was that oftentimes he, he, he grew to understand that oftentimes black officers were more dangerous than white officers because the black officers had something to prove to their mostly white supervisors. And now that's not always true. And there are a lot of uh, black and brown officers in the city of New York, for instance, who have spoken out against the misconduct of the predominant police union in that city, um, the one that has been causing so much of the ruckus in the last couple of months, and there are some of those officers who are standing very strong, and this is true all around the country, against brutality and militarization and profiling, but you're absolutely right that in community after community across the country, there is a tendency for officers, regardless of their race or ethnicity, to view the usual suspects the same way. Um, In fact, I've done trainings with officers where I've asked them, in the first couple of minutes of our time together, hey, what do you think when you see a young black male driving a nice car in your community? And almost every single officer, including the black officers, will say drug dealer or he stole it. Um, And I say, well, what about a young white male, same age, driving the same car in your community? And they'll say, spoiled little rich kid, daddy probably bought him a car. And the black officers are almost just as likely, not quite, but almost as likely to say those things as the white officers. So what it says to me, is that there's a culture within policing that is encouraged. It's not about individual officers. And this is, again, this is about understanding systems versus individuals, right? So just like whiteness is about a system and not white people, when I say police culture, I'm not attacking cops. I'm not saying individual cops are bad people. I don't know if they are or not. I'm not interested in that. They might be good people. They might be bad people. If the system was good, Even bad people couldn't do a lot of damage. If the system is bad, even good people can't do a lot of good, you see. And so in this case, we got a culture that encourages this hair trigger mentality, this cover up blue line mentality, this mentality that says we can't report misconduct because, you know, if you turn in your partner or you turn in another officer, that may be the officer who has to save your life one day. So you can't turn him in. Well, if your partner's doing something that's turn inable and you're not turning them in, what does that say about the culture, right? And that's going to affect every officer to one extent or another. Um, it's also the case that these officers who are of color, are, they're, they're looking at the same media that the white cops look at. So why do you think those cops, when I ask them those questions, have the answers they have? Because they've gotten that impression. They watch the same TV shows. They see the same news, right? And so if the rest of us are getting these stereotypical images because we're being sold those a million different times a day and we've been sold that stuff for years, why would we expect black cops to be immune to that? 
Why would we expect Latino cops to be immune to that? I, you know, if, if anything, it's it's a surprise that 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 they're not more uh, uh, likely to manifest that. So I think the only way we deal with it is to honestly talk about it as a cultural issue within the larger system of policing, so that we can take the blame off those individual cops. It isn't about them. It's about a system that encourages certain types of snap decisions. Now, snap decisions sometimes work out. And snap decisions can be good sometimes. You go with your first instinct. They're usually not fatal. But snap decisions that involve you know, perceived wrongdoers and your weapon um, are a lot more deadly. And so we've got to have some type of process whereby we don't necessarily expect. I, I, I don't think it would be fair to expect the black cops or the Latino cops or Asian cops or indigenous cops to be better than the white cops. I think that's an unfair burden. I don't, I, you know, it's just like expecting Barack Obama to be better on race than a white president. I don't, no, I don't want it to be any worse, but I surely don't expect him to be any better. We got to expect better from all law enforcement by attacking the roots of the cultural problem that encourages this sort of bunker mentality, military mentality. When you got cops roaming the streets in fatigues, you know what the problem is. When you got cops that are patrolling in the community like they are in a war zone, like they are in, you know, Fallujah or something, they're wearing fatigues. Why are you wearing fatigues in the middle of the city? What does that blend in with, right? The whole point of fatigues, the whole point of camo, right? The whole point of camo is to blend in either in the jungle or in the desert. And you're walking around the streets of a city in camo. That's because you think you're a warrior. The military will take you back if you want to re-up, but you don't need to be, but you don't need to be walking around the streets of the city like you're a soldier because you're not a soldier. Whether you're white, black, or brown, you're there to do a very different job. That's a cultural issue. And until we deal with that, we're not going to see cops, be they white, black, or otherwise, probably do a whole heck of a lot better. Let me come all the way to the back. Yeah. Hello. 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 Thank you. Um, speaking to the point that you just brought up at the end of the last question, last year I read an article in the Washington Post where uh, it was disclosed that surplus Pentagon military uh, grade equipment, including weapons, tanks, et cetera, right. are being uh, given to local police communities under the guise that this is to help deal with terrorist activity on uh, U.S. soil, right. but then when we look at the footage of uh, people wanting to set up a peaceful protest in Ferguson, that's where you're seeing these type of equipment and this type of military grade uh, uh, equipment being used. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to kind of get your reaction to, you know, how, how it, it seems so futile as, you know, trying to deal at the level of the community to try to improve the policing when at the federal government we have this sanction by the right. Pentagon to have these level of weapons and this level of equipment being given to our local police forces. Right. Well, I think it speaks to the militarization of the larger society and the way in which over the last several years and certainly since 9-11, we've become an increasingly martial country, increasingly a country that speaks of dealing with problems in a military way. Um, and believes that those will be the best ways. And to believe that these tanks and these weapons and these various implements that are being sent to communities for police are going to be helpful in fighting terrorism is obviously absurd. If you think about those instances of domestic terrorism that have taken place in the last 30 years, a couple things should stand out to you. Number one, of course, is that the overwhelming number of them were committed by white people. Um, who were not Muslim, who claimed to be Christian. And by this, I mean that there are at least 104, last time I counted, that was right after the Boston uh, Marathon bombing. I went through the history and was able to find 104 white individuals, so-called white individuals, um, who had committed acts of terrorism, using the State Department's own definition of terrorism. Um, and these were acts that were either motivated by racist violence or by religious violence, uh, bombing, burning abortion clinics and other family planning centers, bombing gay bars, uh, dance clubs, etc., or overt like racist attacks that were intended to kill lots of people, not just individual hate crimes. Um, we know that these weapons are not being sent to the places whence these white terrorists live, right? In other words, a lot of these individuals like 
So for instance, the ones who lived up in the Hayden Lake, Coeur d'Alene area of Idaho, that, that, that the police department ain't got tanks, right? They're not rolling around in, in cornfields in Nebraska where some of these other guys came from with tanks, right? This is something they're reserving for urban areas heavily populated by people of color. They're not the ones doing terrorism. So we know automatically it's got nothing to do with that. And it also can't solve even the terrorism that we're actually freaked out about, which is just Muslim terrorism. That's all we seem to be. It's, it can't even stop that. I mean, if, if terror, you know, terrorists are not going to come marching down the street in, in like line formation so that your tank could roll up and stop them. This is not Tiananmen Square terrorism. This is not like we're coming like back in the 1700s with our muskets. Like, you know, the, the bombers in, in Boston, I mean, what, what was a tank going to do? I mean, they had backpacks. They dropped the backpacks. It blew up. Like, or people take planes or they hijack. I mean, that's just not, it's, that makes no sense. So clearly what it's about is both the economic incentive of being able to offload this stuff and thereby make it economically profitable for the people who make these things um, as, we, as we ramp down our official war effort, you know, but the weapons makers still need to move their stuff. And this is a really good way to offload that equipment at, uh, at, a, at a cost that's going to be, you know, beneficial to the manufacturers. Um, and we're not going to have to mothball the stuff so we can continue to use it. Um, and uh, it's part of a larger cultural trend, as I said, toward the militarization of everything and the assumption that the people of our own country are in need of such control that we have to go to this extreme. We're seeing the same kind of rhetoric about the border. But of course, only the southern border, not the northern border, but only the southern one. So we, I expect, and we're already seeing, you know, that same kind of martial military type rhetoric about how we're going to police the border. But we're not just going to police it with foot patrols. We're going to have like military equipment and we're going to have drones and we're going to have, you know, night vision devices. And we're going to be able to spot these people and to stop them. It's, it's, it's as if we have declared war on the vulnerable segments of our community. And it's no coincidence that this is happening at the very moment that, that not only racial disparity, but wealth inequality, income inequality, class disparity in general is, is increasing. So if you have rich folks who are increasingly able to go live in gated communities where they can hire private security so they don't have to rely on the cops, they, don't have to, they, can, just, they can just rely on themselves and the people that they hire to protect them. They can get black water to protect them if they want. They can get, you know, whatever. They can stockpile weapons if they want. They do whatever they want. And then as the cities become increasingly economically destroyed, right, then this is the way that you keep the lid on what will inevitably happen as the country continues to pull apart. No society has been able to sustain in the history of the world the level of disparity that we're looking at right now in this country. Right now, wealth inequality in the United States is double what it was during the Roman Empire. Double what it was during the Roman Empire. During the Roman Empire, the wealthiest 1% owned about 16% of the stuff. Now they own a third of the stuff, right? The top, you know, 37 people in the United States, 37 wealthiest people have the same amount of wealth as the bottom half of the country, 157 million people. This is not a sustainable system. So when you don't have a sustainable system, but you don't have any interest in changing the system, what do you do? You got to have tanks, you got to have guns, you got to declare war on your people, and you have to essentially create a prison nation. And that's what we've done. And that's what we're doing. And, and that's one of the things that if we're going to do this work against white supremacy, we also have to do that work against plutocracy and against economic apartheid, all of which are very much connected to one another. We'll do two more real quick. We'll do this one right here. Yes, you. And then we'll do one more over here. And so that's it. I'll go there and there, and then we'll let you get out. Go right ahead. Um, so earlier you were describing, like, white people that are like, or white people, quote unquote, that mm -hmm. are like, very liberal, but they turn their backs on what's actually going on. And I realized that that you described my family uh. so perfectly. <clears throat> <laughs> and um, I was just wondering, like, how can I wake them up? How can I make them see that they need to, like, face what's going on? Well, I mean, it's hard, right? Because every family's different. And since I don't know yours, I don't know what would work. But, um, but, you know, I have one of those families. And I, you know, now on the one hand, I credit my family with a lot of who I am. I already said that. But like I said, my mom's not an activist either. I mean, she's not, and she's never going to be. It's just not, you know, some people, 
and let's just be let's just be fair and upfront and clear about it, and it's no big deal. Some people are just never going to join the movement, quote unquote. They're just not. A lot of people are just not dispositionally, constitutionally cut out for that work, and that's that's true in every society. And we don't have to we don't have to lament that per se, or or criticize people for not being activists per se. I think everybody can do little pieces, though, and some of us are going to do bigger pieces than others, and it's okay, but I think in the case of a family that maybe, you know, has the right ideas but doesn't put them into action, maybe it's, you know, it's baby steps, right? It's figuring out, you know, what are some small things that you might be able to do that once you did them, you'd feel pretty good about it because, after all, you are a nice liberal, right? So you'll feel good, uh, and a good feeling is liberals love that. I mean, you know, we're good with that. So we like to feel good. Um, and so you, you get that good feeling and you think, oh, maybe I could do that again. And so you do something a little, little more and then maybe, you know, and so it builds. And I think if we look, if we got every one of those nice white liberals who don't really do a lot to just do a little bit, there's not a lot of white liberals and progressive people, but there's enough that, that it could, you know, it could, it could make quite a difference. So it might be something as small as, um, as going to a meeting like this and and, and just listening the first time. Not, not say, you don't have to say anything. Just, just go to a meeting, listen, uh, listen to what people have to say. I think a lot of times what keeps people from speaking out is a lack of connection to the people from whom they might draw inspiration. So if you don't know the people whose stories are going to be shared at an event like this, for instance, um, you might not be moved to do much. But the minute you hear one of those stories, when someone actually describes their truth, right, that's the moment that it lights you on fire. When all of a sudden you actually, I mean, that's the thing that gets most people to move from step A to step B is personal connection. It's not statistics. I mean, I shared some stats and data with y'all just because it's important to, to know some of that. But that's not what gets people to go to the barricades. What gets people to go to the barricades, or really not even that, that's a big step, but even just step out of their comfort zone and speak out with their colleagues or challenge the at the PTA meeting or, or, or at the Kiwanis Club or whatever it is that they do, the thing that gets people to do that usually is having this, this emotional stake that personal relationship creates and that all the reading in the world will not. And so maybe it's about asking your parents just to come with you to an event sometime or, 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 or you know, send them a clip of something on YouTube, a documentary they could watch, that, but, but not just one that's real heady and academic, right? One that actually where people are talking about their lived experience and that, you know, and it may or may not move them, but I think that's, that would stand a chance of, because that way you're not, you're not really like going to them and say, come on, get up off the damn couch and put your principles into action. Nobody likes to hear that, right? But... Um, uh, but it's about saying, hey, I thought you might find this really interesting and, and, and inspiring. And, you know, maybe they will, maybe they won't. But the more you keep at that, in a, in a very compassionate, loving, like, hey, y'all are awesome, and could you look at this? You know, <laughs> like, not, not y'all are awesome, but can you look at this? It's, uh, you're awesome, and I'd really like it if you would come with me to this or if you would take a look at this. And, and, and then over time, you never know. People have, have gotten fires lit under them uh, for a lot less, you know. One more, real quick, I promised right there, and then we'll get out of here, yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, Tiananmen Square earlier, and this sort of prompted my question. Um, I'm originally from Burma, and so I was raised in the middle you know, of a civil war, getting essentially in a family that has fought for many years against a military regime, and we came to the, this country, essentially the land of the free, so-called, um, yeah. so that we could have this freedom. And for the last 15 years that I've been here, I've been actively working in grassroots efforts, nonprofit sector, doing a lot of work to talk about racism, diversity, all of these issues that are at the core of what you're speaking to. And I kind of want to ask a personal question about how do you sustain the work that you do as an adult, long term. I mean, when I was in my 20s, it was very clear yeah. what that role was. I mean, I was on the streets protesting, right. doing slam poetry movements, things like that. Right. And then, you know, in my 30s, I did the more appropriate thing of getting an education right. and doing my PhD. Sure. And now I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm, I'm still angry as hell, and I don't right. know what the next step is. Right. You should, you should go back to slam poetry, I think. <laughs> Um, no, I'm just kidding. Well, I'm not necessarily kidding. I mean, look, there's, you don't have to give up slam poetry just because you're you know, older than you were when you did it the first time. But I, I would say this. Um, it's, the key is just knowing that your role is going to change 
as you go through different stages of your life. And it, that's a really good, healthy, mature understanding to reach. And I've only reached it like about, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes before I came here today. Um, right. Was it was this realization? I mean, I'm kidding, but not by much. I sort of started thinking about it real heavily when the Ferguson stuff touched off. Because it was at that moment when I said to myself, you know, I've been doing it this way for a long time. I've been out on the road for 20 years and I've been doing work for 25 at some level, started off grassroots organizing, then 20 years as, an, as a you know, traveling educator, if you will, and as a writer, obviously. And I intend to keep doing that just in some sense because I'm habituated to it. It's what I'm good at and it's what I know. And I, I, you know, I, at this point, I'm sort of, it's sort of hard to teach me new tricks and different things. But I did realize that I needed to play a different role in the wake of this new invigorated movement that I didn't need to necessarily be right there all the time. I don't need to be taking up a bunch of space from these young people who need it and deserve it. I don't have to be in on the strategy call, giving my two cents about what their next protest ought to be. They're smart enough to figure that out. If they need me, they know where to reach me. They know where to reach the older folks. They can pick up the phone or do an email. If they need my advice, they'll ask for it. But right now, they're doing fine without me having to butt in. I don't have to be on the call like, y'all should do this, and y'all should do this, and listen to me because I'm 46. You know, and... And so um, I learned, like, I'm just going to step back. I, when the media calls me to do something about it, you know, I'll turn down three for every, every four that I get. Like, for every, every one I do, I'll, I'll turn down three and I'll steer the media to other people because other people need a chance. So I've just learned to try to balance it out and say, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to play a very, not limited role because this is still a big role, but it's just a very different role. And whatever your role would be, and I can't tell you what that should be, but I think you want to take a role that is sustainable for you, which means, because as you get older, this is the thing, when you're in your 20s, everything, you can pretty much do anything when you're in your 20s, because you got a lot of energy, and you don't need a lot of sleep, and you, and most of us in our 20s are healthier and better shape than we are later on in life, and, you know, and you don't get tired as much, and, you, you know, and you just, and, and so, man, when I was in my 20s, I could be on the road, you know, weeks at a time, and, and, and hardly get any sleep, and I was fine, and now I'm just like, I'm gonna take a nap in between this and the next speech, like, I'm, uh, you know, I just can't even stay awake, but, but, um, but so you have to pick something that's sustainable. And that, and that may mean um, uh, it could be grassroots work, but, but you've got to make sure that it's emotionally not so draining on you as you get older that it creates health problems. Because the thing that most of us who are activists and educators do is we don't take care of ourselves. Um, you know, we don't. We're so busy trying to save the world and fix things that we don't think about our own well-being and so um, we burn out very easily and I think the thing that allows us to sustain is to, is to be realistic about what our role can be. It might be that if this isn't going to be your day-to-day -day professional thing, like if you're not going to be with a particular organization doing work or you're not going to teach uh, or maybe you do teach but you just want to do other things on the side, pick something that's realistic. Like if, you know, obviously you can do some of this kind of work with a PhD as an educator, but you can also do a little thing, you know, every now and then on the side. You go to, you go to community meetings, you go to events, you volunteer to do a few things, keep your hand in that work, go do slam poetry just because that's another way of expressing your truth and if that's something that you enjoy and are good at, then you need to keep doing that. We need like older roles model and you're not old at all but I'm just saying like older older right than what most slam poets are we need people that are out there doing that um, demonstrating that art can be created at any age by anyone um, you know figure out something that you're passionate about that you love to do but just do it in moderation because as we get older we just cannot burn on the same burn that we burn when we're 23 or when we're 27 or when we're 37 like at, over time you just have to you have to move back just a little bit from it and I'll tell you the one other thing and this isn't so much about the work as it is taking care of yourself personally the thing that's allowed me to sustain this other than you know my family which inspires me a lot obviously and my kids who inspire me a lot but it's just that I've I've taken very deliberate steps to surround myself with lots of different people, including a lot of people who really aren't that into this work. Like, I mean, they, they, they support it, you know? Like, my wife is not an activist. This is not her thing. Now, she loves me dearly, and she supports what I do, and she's proud of what I do, and, you know, but it's not, it's not what gets her out of bed every day. So what's awesome is, when I go home, right, I, it's not that I turn it off entirely because I'm still paying attention to the news and I'm still writing stuff and I'm still researching, but I can also just like shift to a different mode where I can say, okay, hey, let's go to a movie. Let's go out to eat. Let me take the kids to the park. Let's do, you know, and I can get away from it just for a minute 
right? Which everybody needs. To, if, if you have the privilege and luxury of doing it, you need to do it because um, uh, you car you know, if you surround yourself with nothing but activists. I mean, there was a period where I was like that. Like everybody in my life was a militant activist, and I was freaking miserable, right? <laughs> I hated them. I hated me. I was actually saying stuff like the only people that I hate almost as much as far right wing folks are far left wing folks. And those were my folks. Like, and I still didn't like them because I was surrounded by them all the time. And they, just, and they had a way of talking and a way of speaking. They were always on. It's like I grew up in a family. My dad was a stand up comic and an actor. So he was always on stage. Always. You know what that's like growing up in a house with somebody who's always performing all the time? That was just exhausting. Well, it's the same thing when you're with a bunch of lefties and they're all performing because they're all trying to show you just how damn radical they are. So they use all kinds of words that nobody outside of your little cell even understands. All these words from like critical theory classes that they took in college and they're, and they're using them wrong anyway. They're not even using the words right. They're not even using the words right, and they're just throwing them out because it's just that's how I'm gonna prove that I'm right, and I'm gonna tweet that shit, and I'm gonna and I'm gonna put all that on social media just to show you how bright I am. And at some point, you just go, "Holy hell! I just need to hang. I just need to go see some like stupid comedy at the movie theater that is not even probably funny, but has no political context at all. Just because I need a break, I just need. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna turn on um, some sporting event. I'm gonna watch college basketball for a minute. I just need to do something other than this. And so, by surrounding myself with a lot of different people, some of whom are clearly, you know, activists and radicals, and but a lot of people you know, who are not, being able to go to an event with a bunch of friends of my wife and me, mostly maybe her, but also my friends as well, and not really even talk about this stuff, but maybe for five minutes of that, because they'll want to catch up and find out what's going on, and we might talk a little bit, but then we're talking about our kids, then we're talking about what they're doing, then we're talking, you know, it's great, because I, it lets me sort of come back to a place that's sustainable, as opposed to being in that space that I think too many of us find ourselves where we're just constantly gunning an engine. It's like when you turn on that car and you don't know that it's turned over and you keep clicking it and it, now it's grinding and you're like, oh shit, it was on, you know? And, and, and it's like, but we're always doing that. It's like we're, we're on and then it's like, and we don't hear that it's grinding. We just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. And it's gonna kill us. It's gonna kill us. So find something sustainable, do what you can. Don't try to do everything. Try to find some other folks. Y'all can divide the labor, divide the work and just bite off as much as you're willing to bite off at a given moment. And don't be worried about stepping back from it for a second if you need to, because um, it's not gonna be you, and it's not gonna be me, and it's not gonna be any other individual in this room who's gonna crack the code. We're all gonna have to figure it out together. And in order for that to happen, we're all gonna have to keep breathing. That much I know. Thank you all so much for being here.